Same complaint. Oh, oh, oh dear. Oh, sorry, Major. Sorry. Okay, I'll do that right away. Yeah, I'll do it. Bye. Hello everyone, it's the 14th video in the Centre Ecology series and as you can see, new surroundings for the last two episodes. Isn't that exciting? Yes, <laughs> and also you can see new felt tips. I was getting a bit bored of the other ones and I feel like they weren't coming out so well on the camera. So to avoid all the masses of letters I get sent in, I'm complaining, I decided to change them. Exciting. Now, today we're going to look at a completely different sense. In a sense which we can do, and it's chemoreception. This is the biological reception of chemical stimuli. And as you'd expect, the receptors responsible are called chemoreceptors. And these are receptors involved in both olfaction and gustation. Okay, basically tasting. Okay, olfaction is dealing with airborne stimuli. Gustation, on the other hand, always involves direct contact. Now you might think, God, these are two fundamental sensors. You know, when you were little, they were two of the five sensors that you learnt about, weren't they? So why the hell are we cramming them into one video? Well, you'll notice they're actually pretty similar. They work in very, very similar ways. Now, anything that you see around you can be described as a chemical, really. It's a bit of a vague word, but we can classify them into two different types of chemical. These are the organic and inorganic chemicals. Organic chemicals all contain carbon, okay? That is the definition. It doesn't get simpler than that, does it? And inorganic chemicals are all the other chemicals which don't contain carbon. Well, you bet there's a lot of organic compounds out there because that basically is what makes up life, isn't it? Without that, we wouldn't have biology. And actually, the ability to sense chemical stimuli is thought to be the oldest form of communication. If you go back billions of years, you know, when life was first emerging, those tiny little bacteria or whatever they were could move towards food along chemical gradients. And using the same principles, these unicellular organisms could use these chemical cues to move away from substances which could be harmful to them, for example, or get rid from excre excretory products and things like that. Okay, so let's talk about taste then. Okay, now the first thing to get right is that the word taste, as we think it, actually means flavour. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So. Taste is actually the combination of input from mouth receptors, olfaction, and somatosensory perception. So it's the whole package, basically. It includes everything from our taste buds to our smell receptors. It was Mombert that described this in 2004. Because it's like, I mean, I've never tried this before in my life, but apparently if you block your nose or cut off all your smell receptors and eat an onion, it tastes the same as an apple. I don't know, has anyone tried that before? Or is that an old wife's tale? I don't know. Well, the first thing to ask is, what on earth is taste for? That's a bit of a weird question, isn't it? Well, taste is basically to act as a gatekeeper. It's to check where what you're consuming is good for you, okay? And it's conducted by taste buds in the oral cavity. Now, the good main point here is that these chemicals must be water soluble for them to interact with those taste buds and we're going to be having a closer look at them in a second okay but what are the tastes then what are the five primary tastes well there's six now apparently here they are well there's salty there's sour there's sweet there's bitter and there's umami <laughs> what is umami well umami literally translates as delicious. 
apparently. This is found in various artificial flavorings. You can get it in from certain amino acids, um, L-glutamate and aspartate. Okay. Now there is another flavour which is in a bit of debate at the moment, and that's metallic. Okay, <laughs> don't ask me what that's all about. Okay, so what is a taste bud exactly then? Well, a taste bud consists of several receptor cells, so you'll get a pore, and in that pore you'll have a fluid-filled receptor. And that, inside that receptor is where those receptor cells are, with loads of microvilli, which interact with molecules that enter it. And these taste buds are arranged in a layered structure called papillae. Okay. Now, what is interesting that within each taste bud there isn't just one type of taste receptor. For example, there isn't a taste bud which just detects salt, salty flavours. There isn't just a taste bud which detects bitter flavours and so on. Each taste bud has all the different taste receptors in it. And each of these taste receptors has a specific mechanism of dealing with that flavour, okay? So, for example, the bitter, um, the sweet and the umami flavours have specific protein receptors. For the sour and the salty, slightly different things happen. If you take something sour, well that's due to acid, okay? And acid, what characterises an acid are protons or hydrogen ions, okay? So as those hydrogen ions enter your papillae, what they do is block off ion channels. And it's this blocking off of ion channels which gives you a sour taste somehow. That's just how the cellular machinery works. To take salty, it's actually the easiest of them all. Salt obviously consists of sodium chloride. And the way we perceive it is simply that sodium passing through the receptors, changing the electric potential. So that means an action potential is produced all the way to the nervous system, the one to the CNS. Now I say an action potential is produced, but just like some of the receptors we talked about in a previous video, like in the Think in the Electroreception video, the receptors themselves don't produce action potentials, they don't have axons, okay? So that means they produce a receptor potential and they can be called secondary nerve fibres. Now how these different tastes are encoded by the CNS is a bit of a mystery. Okay, I mean it could be quite simple. So one cell responds to a particular taste, each of these five tastes, possibly the sixth one, and then that links to a specific place in the CNS which then responds to it accordingly. Okay, however it could be a bit more complicated than that. Maybe there aren't just five nerve fibres, for the five different tastes. Maybe there's a connection between the two and it's the relative amounts of action potentials from each of the receptors which determines what we perceive. Okay, does that make sense? Another possibility is that each cell could be expressing the five receptors for the five different tastes but in different proportions. Okay, so it's a bit up in the air, it's amazing how much we don't know actually, but the moment evidence is currently pointing towards the simplest solution. Now the papillae that I was talking about occur in different locations. Obviously, the obvious place is in the tongue, they also occur on the soft palate and in the um, upper esophagus and epiglottis. Now there are several different forms of papillae, so let's look at a diagram of a tongue now to describe them. Okay, so to start with, there's the circumvallate papillae. There are about 8 to 12 of these in humans. There's the foliate papillae, which form shorter grooves at the side of the tongue. There's the fungiform papillae, which are like circumvallate papillae, but without um, the wall around it. And these are very, very abundant in the tongue. Okay, and lastly, there's the filiform papillae. Now these are slightly different because these aren't taste buds technically, but instead are used to measure the structure of the food. So in a way, they act as a form of mechanoreception. Okay, so they're detecting the texture of the food rather than the taste. Now it's a popular misconception that certain parts of the tongue are responsive to particular tastes compared to other parts of the tongue, right? 
That's not true, okay? Every part of the tongue is sensitive to all the tastes, so you can detect saltiness from here, her hair, her hair, everywhere, yeah? But just at different degrees, so there's particular areas where your taste perception is very strong, okay? But that's just general. You haven't got a better place to detect salty flavours or sour flavours um, on your tongue. As you know, there's a lot of genetic variation hanging around us, so that means there's a lot of variation in um, the tasting sensitivities of particular people. So you can get non-tasters and you can get super tasters, and this is all genetic. Non-tasters is the inherited ability to taste bitter compounds. Super tasters, on the other hand, are more sensitive to a greater variety of oral stimuli. Okay. And this is probably due to a greater density of fungiform papillae. They're the main taste buds that we talked about earlier. And of course we must remember that the amount of taste buds differs between species. It's thought that we have around 9,000 taste buds um, in us, whilst pigs have 15,000. <laughs> okay, so maybe they should get a pig to judge MasterChef. Oh wait, they already do. Ha ha ha, Greg Wallace. <laughs> Okay, so that's taste then, or flavour, as we now know it to be. Let's look at olfaction then. Now, olfaction is much, much more important when you think about it, because this gives info on chemical composition before contact. Okay, so it's before the taste receptors can even get to it. Okay, so it's much more important. And it's the primary sense for a lot of organisms. Now, communication within organisms, within a body, involves hormones, okay? We know quite a lot about hormones already. Pheromones are used for communication between organisms, and this is going to be particularly relevant here, okay? But first, let's look at the receptors then. Now, what's particularly interesting is that if you look at the olfactory receptors of invertebrates and vertebrates, they're actually quite similar to each other. So that suggests to us they're quite old. They evolved a long, long time ago. And these, unlike the taste receptors, these are primary receptors with their own axons, okay? So that means they can send off action potentials. Now, one thing you may be realizing is that, well, insects have a cuticle, and like us. Okay, so how do they deal with it? Well, the receptors are still pretty much the same. They're still fluid-filled receptors, but in the cuticle, there's little pores which allow scent molecules or whatever chemicals floating around in the air to enter. Now, Axel, in 2005, wanted to study the olfactory pathway. In particular, the olfactory bulb. That's where all the information on our smell goes into. Okay, and it consists of what we call glomeruli, the singular being glomerulus. And what was found was that all the receptors in the sensory epithelium that express the same chemoreceptor project signals into the same glomerulus, which is in the olfactory bulb. Now when we look at mammals, we see that all mammals have what we call an MOE. What's that then? A main olfactory epithelium, of course, and signals from these always go to the olfactory bulb. It's connected to the olfactory bulb by nerves that go through the skull cavity, right? But there's also something else. There's the vomeronasal organ. This is something which is also known as the Jacobson's organ. These receptors project into an accessory olfactory bulb. Okay, and this organ is mainly what's used for pheromone detection. And at least a certain interesting behaviours. If you go to the zoo and you go to the tapir enclosure, you may notice them starting to do this. A bit, right, okay? Well, that behaviour is what's called Fleming. Okay, and that is used to direct pheromones into its vomeronasal organ. Oh. Now, in the olfactory epithelium, there are 900 types of receptors. 
So that means each of those 900 receptors has its own gene coding for it. That makes it the biggest mammalian gene superfamily. Okay, so that's quite impressive. But the structure of these receptors is actually quite simple. They consist of seven transmembrane proteins. And interactions with these receptors leads to what we call a G-protein signaling cascade, which we actually talked a little bit about when we looked at vision. Okay, seeing some overlap here. And interestingly, all these genes are found on loads of different chromosomes, including the sex chromosomes, so they're distributed everywhere throughout the genome. Now one thing we've got to state is that of these 900 genes, not all of them are active. Okay, there's some pseudogenes creeping in. So pseudogenes, uh, genes which look like genes, but they're not actually functioning. Okay, now this is where something quite interesting comes in. Some guy called Gillad in 2004 decided to look for the link between olfactory perception and vision. So basically we're looking for what's called a cross-modal link between the two sensors. Now we talked about in the colour vision video on how some new world monkeys are, well, the males are dichromats while some of the females are trichromats, right? We talked about that. And work was done on primates on this and they found that primates that were trichromats, so had three colour receptors, had a greater proportion of pseudogenes relating to olfaction. So that means their olfactory sensitivity, how well they could smell basically, decreased as their colour vision got better. Okay, and a perfect example um, of this is the howler monkey. Now howler monkey uh, is one of the new world monkeys, but it's one of the few trichromat New World Monkeys, okay? So it has three colour receptors. And what you find is, is that the percentage of pseudogenes um, in these olfactory receptors is greater in the Howler Monkey than in any other of the New World Monkeys, okay? Incidentally, we, of course, are trichromats, and we have about 50% of these genes active, okay? So the other 50% are pseudogenes. So this is a perfect example of a trade-off occurring in nature. So an animal has to decide, I mean, it's not really decided, but you know what I mean, on what sense is more important to it, vision or smelling, okay? Clearly for us, it was vision. There are several adaptations for vision. Dogs, for example, can separate the air needed for breathing and olfaction. That's quite useful. Um, small diving mammals, which dive underwater to catch their prey, trap air bubbles in their nostrils. That, those air bubbles then um, interact with volatiles in the water, which then goes into the nose. Fish are even better at this. They can stream water over that sensory epithelium. Okay. Now, the spiny lobster, some work's been done on the spiny lobster, and the spiny lobster has really tall antennae. And it's on these antennae where those olfactory receptors are. Okay, and what these spiny lobsters are doing is um, overcoming what's called the boundary layer effect. The boundary layer effect is that water moves slower over smooth surfaces. Okay, so that means less chemicals, less volatiles, or whatever that lobster wishes to detect, they're less likely to enter the sensory epithelium if those receptors were on a smooth surface. Other animals create turbulent flow to let chemicals contact receptors. Okay, okay now once an olfactory um, receptor is activated, it responds, then if that stimulus is prolonged for a certain amount of time, you get adaptation. Now there's two different types of olfactory adaptation that we need to know about here. There's receptor adaptation. Well, that is basically what I've just been talking about. That's a decrease in response with continued exposure. It's like when you walk into a bakery, 
and you smell bread, lovely smell of bread, after about five minutes, you can't smell the bread anymore. Okay, there's a receptor adaptation. The other one is cognitive habituation. Okay, now cognitive habituation is something you get, let's say, when you go on holiday for a month or so, and then you come back to your house and you notice how lovely your house smells. So this is a psychological and neuronal process which, after continued exposure to an odorant, you're no longer able to perceive it. Okay, so that's taste and olfaction then. So let's look on how good chemicals are to be used in communication. And to cut a long story short, they're not that great at all, if I'm honest with you. There's no directionality from a chemical. If an animal receives a chemical, it can't really be sure on where that chemical's come from. There's no vector component. Okay, so that isn't particularly great. It's also quite slow. Chemicals can take days, months, minutes. You know, you're not really sure how long that chemical's been passing through the atmosphere before it reaches you. Temporal patterning is also pretty poor because most of a chemical signal is lost within a very short distance from the sender. So that's pretty bad. And lastly, there's no spectrum to chemical stimuli. There's no one dimension in which it can be plotted. Instead, you've got a diverse range of compounds which can be mixed together in a whole variety of different ways to create different cocktails, if you like. So all these disadvantages of chemical communication is most likely what promoted the evolution of other sensors. We've already talked about how this type of communication was probably, it's probably the oldest sense. Okay, so because it's not that great, because of the reasons we've been saying, is what has promoted the evolution of sensors such as vision, um, hearing, all the other things that we've been talking about. Now a lot of the sense produced in chemical communication can be produced by glands, and these are produced by epithelial cells. There's the mevacrine glands, which consist of vesicles which produce that chemical, and that way those volatile substances can then be released into the environment and picked up by another organism. Okay, there's apocrine glands where parts of the cells disintegrate and it's this which forms the sense, these disintegrated bits of those epithelial cells. And lastly, there's the holocrine glands. This is where whole cells die off, they're killed and it's that which produces the scent and this is usually a thick and oily substance. Now when looking at chemical compounds produced by an organism, by doing loads of fancy chemical analysis, you can get an idea on what a specific chemical might be used for. For example, there's loads of things here which you can look at. Molecular weight for example, if you've got a really heavy molecule, then that may suggest to you that that chemical isn't designed to go very far. The number of components, the number of chemical components in the molecule may suggest how individual that molecule is. Maybe an animal wants to produce a chemical which is unique to itself and to do that, well, it needs to include as great a number of unique components as possible. So it's these kind of chemicals which may be used in marking a territory, for example. So it's this which increases recognition between animals. There are also other things. An aromatic ring apparently increases the stability of a molecule. And a carbonyl group makes a compound, chemical compound more water soluble. So once again, it's giving an idea on the potential use of that chemical compound to an animal. Now the absolute kings when it comes to glands are the ants. They have a huge multitude of different glands used for all sorts of different things. Some glands produce chemicals involved in mate attraction, some release alarm pheromones for example, some um, release chemicals for allo-grooming um, of conspecifics, um, some are to get rid of infection by bacteria, so act like antibiotics basically. Um, things like deer, ruminants, um, release um, chemicals using a gland in between their hooves, which leaves a trail as they walk across. Now the transmission of chemicals um, can occur in a variety of different ways. There are three main ways in which 
the transmission of a chemical can move across, okay? So there's obviously diffusion, um, that's pretty simple, we know all about diffusion. There's laminar flow and then there's turbulent flow. And the transmission technique that a particular chemical uses to move through its environment depends on what's called the Reynolds number. Okay, and I've written the equation here, don't you worry about that, but it's basically inertial forces divided by viscous forces. So it all depends on the chemical and the medium in which it's travelling in. So at very low Reynolds numbers you get diffusion and at really high Reynolds numbers you get turbulent flow as the mode of transmission. Now animals can orientate themselves using what's called chemotaxis, which is response to a chemical gradient. Now there are three different types of chemotaxis, so let's look into them in a bit more detail then. First of all there's rheotaxis. This is orientation in the current where the best option is usually to go upstream. So basically, you detect a chemical, it's getting stronger and stronger, so you just move and move along that chemical gradient. Okay, that's quite simple. The other one is clinotaxis. This is at very low Reynolds numbers, where an animal has to keep taking consecutive measurements. And using that, they can change their direction accordingly. Okay, the final one is tropotaxis. Okay, this is when you have two receptors and you're comparing the difference um, in the chemical that you receive between the two receptors to decide which way you need to go. Now don't get me wrong, these three types of chemotaxis could be happening at exactly the same time. You could be doing all three of these things, but uh, it's just a way of dissecting chemotaxis into three main components. Now chemotaxis is used in moths to detect pheromones emitted by females and it's shown that when at rest the males move their wings which increases the airflow which wafts air over their antennae so they can pick up those molecules because that's where the receptors are. And they do something a little bit more interesting as studied by Alan et al in 2011. What they do is that they zigzag when in a plume, so they, when they can detect the pheromone, they zigzag in the plume upstream, so against the air current basically, and this is called chemoanemotaxis. Right. Once they get out of the plume, then they fly perpendicular to it, because that increases the chance that they'll meet that plume again, and then they can carry on this whole zigzagging pattern until they reach the source of um, who released that pheromone, which is going to be a lovely female which they can mate with. Now there's an even more lovely experiment um, which has shown stereo and serial sniffing navigation in, I've got to be honest, one of my favourite animals and that is the mole. And this was studied by Catania et al in 2013. Now moles, as we know, live underground. They live in a world full of scent basically because they can't see very well. There's no point in seeing very well. So they've got very specialised noses. And what this experiment did is that if you block off one of those nostrils, then these moles are less good at detecting a target. So a nice tasty worm or something. They'll go in the wrong direction. Now, an even more clever experiment was done where pipes were put inside the nostrils of the nose. This sounds a bit gruesome, but bear with me. So imagine these two pens are one of the pipes then. So this pipe was pushed up the nose of the mole and it was twisted so it was pointing in the opposite direction. So it was pointing to the left rather to the, the, the right. Okay, then another tube was put into the other nostril and that pointed in that direction. Okay, so the left nostril was pointing to the right and the right nostril was pointing to the left. Okay, so as you'd imagine that would confuse the moles quite a bit. This time they have a longer search time and don't find the prey. So this is an example of directional olfaction in an animal. Anyway, that's all I've got time for today. Next time is the last video and we're going to look and something completely different. We're going to go back onto hearing again and look at probably one of the most famous 
um, weird sensors in the whole of the animal kingdom. And that is bat echolocation. So I'll see you then.